Hello everyone, this is Zahar again. Uh, today we are going to do the Neuroanatomy, Histology and Developmental Biology review in this uh, video. So let us quickly start with this. So we can see different uh, topics here like um, starting with the nervous system where we discuss about the cranial nerves, veins and its structure. Then uh, different types of cranial nerves with the spinal cord, peripheral nervous system then oral histology and finally the developmental biology okay so firstly uh, we should know how we uh, classify the nervous system into uh, central nervous system and peripheral central nervous system is made up of spinal cord and brain and peripheral is somatic and autonomic autonomic is divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic and somatic into 12 pair of cranial nerves 31 pair of spinal nerves all the nerve plexuses they come into somatic nervous system now we see uh, on this page as we can see uh, about the cerebrum it makes 80 percent of the brain mass and cerebrum is made up of uh, four pair lobes frontal parietal temporal occipital uh, two cerebral hemispheres and we should know that cortex is the gray matter and uh, medulla is the white because of the myelin sheath and then important structure corpus callosum that connect both the right and the left cerebral hemisphere so we can see different lobes here frontal parietal temporal occipital and this is called as the brodmann classification of the brain cortex the frontal lobe is the primary motor area uh, parietal lobe is for the taste perception primary sensory area number 312 um, then uh, temporal lobe is for olfaction hearing and occipital is area number 17 for the visual cortex so you can remember the area numbers two here that are given some of the important areas we can see is associative auditory cortex that is Wernicke area area number 22 then auditory cortex given 41 and 42 and Broca's speech area and that is present in the frontal lobe that's area number 44 and 45 now we can discuss about the diencephalon. Diencephalon, as we know, it's made up of thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. Epithalamus has the pineal gland in it, and this gland produces melatonin that controls your sleep-wake cycle. We can also see about the thalamus and hypothalamus, the stable. The thalamus is considered as the sensory relay station, so all the sensations before they end up in the brain cortex, they go through the thalamus. Now in this table, we know the VPM, which is uh, transferring the facial sensation including pain that's important and for hypothalamus all the nucleus we should know because hypothalamus is involved in homeostasis and the temperature of the body is controlled by hypothalamus also hypothalamus controlling your hunger satiety septal nucleus involved in aggressive behavior suprachiasmatic nucleus of hypothalamus involved in circadian rhythm and very important supraoptic and paraventricular nucleus they produce adh and oxytocin we can see the picture of the diencephalon 2 now we can start with the optic nerve here so we know optic nerve is a nerve for vision and it starts from the ganglionic cell of the retina and the important part here is the optic chiasma so optic tract fibers which are crossing over it's optic chiasma that's the reason if you have injury to the right optic tract you will get blind in the left eye and vice versa now we can see here something called as pupillary light reflex right that's a very very important it's always asked in the exam so when you show light to your pupil your pupil are constricting that is called as a light reflex direct light reflex for the same eye showing the light indirect or consensual reflex is for the other eye so this is the path where the reflex arc optic nerve edinger vascular nucleus short ganglia ciliary nerve so edinger vascular nucleus present in the midbrain it is a nucleus involved in the pathway for both the pupillary reflex and the accommodation response as well. So accommodation and convergence response is important. So when you are looking something farther from your eyes and then you look at something closer to your eyes, how's you, how your eyes are accommodating when you look at something closer to your eyes? That is called as the near response. So three things are going to happen. Number one, pupil will constrict. Number two, eyeball will move towards the midline, converge. And number three, lens will become more convex. So in this pathway also, we can see edinger vascular nucleus is being involved. Now, 
Now we are coming to the next nerve, the seventh nerve, the facial nerve. Again, we should know everything about the facial nerve, the coarse point of it that are being mentioned and we know it is also a mixed nerve which has the motor, sensory and also the secretomotor component, parasympathetic to lacrimal gland, submandibular and the sublingual gland. We also know the caudal tympani branch of facial nerve will provide taste sensation to the anterior two-third of the tongue. Now we see uh, the facial reflexes, right? So we have the corneal reflex and the jaw jugular reflex. Corneal reflex, when you touch the cornea with the cotton, both eyes are uh, closing. So for this, again, we should know the sensory component that is taking the sensation of touching the cornea, that is by ophthalmic division of trigeminal V1. And the one which is closing the eye, the muscle orbicularis oculi, that is innervated by seventh. So seventh nerve becomes the efferent E motor component and sensory component is V1 ophthalmic division of trigeminal. While for the jaw jug reflex, mouth open and relax, tap the chin lightly to get the contraction. So for this, when your mouth closes by tapping of chin, tapping of chin sensation is carried by V3 mandibular division of trigeminal and closing of mouth is by masseter and that is innervated by V3 again. So V3 is both sensory and motor component for the jaw jug reflex. Okay, so on this page we can discuss about the glossopharyngeal nerve and the motor component of glossopharyngeal nerve supplies talopharyngeus and the sensory component is supplying your mucosa of pharynx. Posterior one third of the tongue, we know both the sensory and motor component comes from ninth, pistol sensory and the gag reflex, right? The sensory component is by glossopharyngeal and the motor component is by vagus. Now the chemoreceptor carotid body and the baroreceptor carotid sinus, they're also innervated by number ninth. Parotid via otic ganglia, parasympathetic, lacepetrosal, glossopharyngeal. That's a branch of glossopharyngeal. You can also see this picture. Very good picture. Okay, so now we are coming to the next topic of oral histology in which uh, we firstly discuss about different layers of oral mucosa. We know oral mucosa is stratified squamous epithelium, but it could be keratinized or non-keratinized depending upon the location. So when we discuss about different layers, we can see that the stratum basale is the bottommost layer we have, which is also called the stratum germativum, where all the my epithelial mitotic activity is happening. It is one of the least cytodifferentiated layer we have. Above basale, we have stratum spinosum. There's a prickly cell layer. Langerhans cells are often extending into this layer. Then we have stratum granulosum, which has the keratohyaline granules on it and stratum corneum that is going to be topmost layer. Cells are flattened here, pycnotic with few cell organelles. Now below the epithelium, we have the basement membrane. So stratum basale cells are resting on basement membrane that has type 4 collagen and laminin. And below the basement membrane, you have the connective tissue that is called as lamina propria. And it has two layers, the papillary layer and the reticular layer. So in the papillary layer, you have the intersection of the reti ridges that are the dropping from the epithelium into the connective tissue and you have the papillae that are extending from the connective tissue to the epithelium. So where these two uh, down growth and the projections, they're intersecting with each other that is found in papillary layer. And below the mucosa, you have the submucosa. Okay. So let us talk about the dentine now. So dentine, as we know, it's an elastic uh, uh, avascular mineralized tissue that is harder than bone but softer than enamel. And uh, dentine, it arises from ectomesenchymal cells of dental papilla. So dental papilla cell will differentiate to become odontoblast by the ameloblastic induction. And the dentine matrix uh, formation start by odontoblast at the DEJ and it will slowly progress towards the pulp inwards. So the first dentine matrix formed by the odontoblast that has mainly type 1 collagen that is called as the predentine. Now as the odontoblasts are retreating inward, they are leaving cytoplasmic extensions behind them. And those are called as the odontoblastic processes which are actually the Tomy's fiber, the nerve fiber found inside the dentinal tubules. Now these odontoblastic processes will release some matrix vesicles 
and we know that they are going to start mineralization of your dentine by deposition of hydroxyapatite crystals. So the first form dentine is called as a mental dentine and all the dentine deposited thereafter is called as the circumpulpal dentine. So circumpulpal dentine is deposited in the form of uh, globules and these globules they will calcify and form a complete calcified mass but sometimes this interglobular this uh, globules they don't fuse so they, they develop a hypomineralized zone in between that is called as interglobular dentine which is less mineralized than normal intertubular dentine produced between the tubule is also less mineralized while the peritubular dentine that is hypermineralized and when this peritubular dentine will occlude the dentinal tubule it is called as the sclerotic dentine sclerotic dentine definitely has a longer etching time as compared to normal dentine because it is hyper mineralized okay so now let us discuss about the enamel enamel we know is the most calcified and brittle substance in the human body it is semi-translucent and enamel arises from ectodermal cells of the inner enamel epithelium so these cells will differentiate and become ameloblast ameloblasts are going to induce cell of dental papilla to become odontoblast and we know odontoblast is going to lay down the dentine matrix first and then the ameloblasts are going to make the enamel matrix so enamel matrix produced by ameloblast it uh, starts virtually perpendicular to the dej and progress outward towards the eventual tooth surface so you can see the oldest enamel is located at the dej underlying the cusp or the cingulum so as the ameloblasts retreat Tomis processes are formed around them and these Tomis processes they will help in mineralization of the enamel. Final mineralization of enamel is called as maturation with the iron influx and removal of protein and water which will form hydroxyapatite crystals and the enamel so like the dentine structure was made up of dentinal tubule the enamel structure is made up of enamel rods. So enamel rods are in the form of a keyhole with the head made up of one ameloblast and the tail made up of three ameloblasts. So total four ameloblasts are needed to make one enamel rod. Now the cusp tip, the enamel rod can appear twined and intertwined and that is called as the nard enamel. Once the enamel maturation is complete, the outer enamel epithelium, so there are four layers of enamel organ, we know, outer enamel epithelium, inner enamel epithelium, stalid reticulum and stator intermedium. So middle two layers, stalid reticulum and stator intermedium will collapse and now you have only two layers remaining, outer and inner enamel epithelium that are going to make the reduced enamel epithelium. And this reduced enamel epithelium is worn soon away after tooth eruption, quickly replaced by salivary pallical and we know finally reduced enamel epithelium will make the junctional epithelium that is found on the CJ or entirely on the enamel surface. Now we start with a very important topic the embryology of the face and pharyngeal arches. We know pharyngeal arches will start forming at around 3.5 weeks of the life and they migrate into the pharyngeal arches around week 4 making vistrocanium that covers the bones of your face and the neurocanium that formed around the cranial neural tube and around your future brain. So we can see different brinkel arches, pouches and the cleft. So there are three embryological structure. Arches which are mesodermal, pouches which are endodermal or clefts or grooves which are ectodermal. So each arch gives rise to a nerve, artery, muscle and cartilage. Arch number um, 5th, 7th, 9th and 10th nerves are brinchomeric because they arise from the brinkel arches. So the entire table of the brinkel are structures what are the derivatives of them? Brinkel groove derivative, the cleft derivative or the pouches derivative. They are very, very important. So we can see here in this picture how the development of the face is starting. So formation of the face, we have the first arch processes, the maxillary and the mandibular processes. Where maxillary processes form the upper cheek region and most of the upper lip. While the mandibular process that is also formed from arch 1, it will make the lower lip and the lower one third of the face. Now the frontonasal process is formed with the growth of forebrain. It develops into forehead and nose. And two medial nasal processes, they will merge together to form frontonasal process. That will form the filtrum of the upper lip. 
Now, the nasal placode, they arise from either side of frontonasal processes. They form the middle nasal processes, pair of them, which form bridge of nose, nostril, upper lip, philtrum, while the lateral nasal processes, lateral nasal processes, they are find, forming the side, ala, or the wings of the nose. Now, we can see here the formation of the mandible. As we know, it arises next to the Meckel's cartilage. Meckel's cartilage dissolves and give rise to only a small part of your air ossicle, while the mandibular mandible we know is formed from the mandibular process. Now, mouth and oral cavity, it starts as a slight depression on the stomodium and located between arch one and forebrain, and there's a buccopharyngeal membrane that will separate the stomodium and the pharynx until 24 days of life. After that, this membrane is going to get rupture, and now the mouth and pharynx are continuous with each other. Hi, my dear student who are preparing for IMDD ADAT or part two exam. Uh, thanks so much for watching this review video of the subject. If you really liked it, please buy the full version by clicking on the link given in the description. With the purchase of every video, you will be getting free live assessment and evaluations on the subject as well. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the DentaBest channel now to get the latest updates on the smart videos. If you have any questions, please comment me in the box below. I, Dr. Seher from Dentavest, wishes you all the best for exam and thanks again for watching.